We're going to see if newborns can count as early as five months in our lab today. All six of the babies in this room are under six months old. Closed circuit television will allow you to monitor their reactions. Babies gaze longer when they don't see what they expect to see, which is the basis for this investigation. To begin, we'll let two dolls to walk gently in front of the babies to get their bearings. The two dolls will be hidden behind a screen from the baby's view, though. When the screen is removed, you must note how long the newborns gaze at the dolls. Next, two dolls will emerge in front of the babies before they vanish. Afterwards, there will be still another doll. There are just two dolls visible when the screen is removed for the infants. If our hypothesis is correct, the newborns will now gaze more intently since they were expecting to see three dolls when they really saw just two. It's incredible to believe that so young a youngster may be able to add and subtract. My own investigations have led me to believe that they are born with this capacity. Regardless of whether or not they do, perhaps we should ask a different one. Is it okay to take advantage of this aptitude by introducing mathematics to young children? Is it a good idea for parents to put pressure on their children at an early age? We're going to see if newborns can count as early as five months in our lab today. All six of the babies in this room are under six months old. Closed circuit television will allow you to monitor their reactions. Babies gaze longer when they don't see what they expect to see, which is the basis for this investigation. To begin, we'll let two dolls to walk gently in front of the babies to get their bearings. The two dolls will be hidden behind a screen from the baby's view, though. When the screen is removed, you must note how long the newborns gaze at the dolls. Next, two dolls will emerge in front of the babies before they vanish. Afterwards, there will be still another doll. There are just two dolls visible when the screen is removed for the infants. If our hypothesis is correct, the newborns will now gaze more intently since they were expecting to see three dolls when they really saw just two. It's incredible to believe that so young a youngster may be able to add and subtract. My own investigations have led me to believe that they are born with this capacity. Regardless of whether or not they do, perhaps we should ask a different one. Is it okay to take advantage of this aptitude by introducing mathematics to young children? Is it a good idea for parents to put pressure on their children at an early age? To this day, I'm 43 years old, and I'm still saddled with a sizable amount of student loan debt. Yes, I was aware that I was taking out a lot of debt while attending college. It was only when I received two loans that I discovered the looming rock avalanche. Even now, 15 years later, I still have moments of absolute terror when it comes to the financial status of my family. My monthly student loan payment is more than three times the amount I pay for my automobile. As a result, I wouldn't have landed my current position without a four-year degree. Because of it, I'm thankful, but at what price? My debts have been growing at a 10% annual pace, and they've now reached unmanageable proportions. You know I'm an English major. Their debts will never be repaid. We're in over our heads in debt with no end in sight. Because I'm in a class of grads whose only hope of attending college was to borrow money from the government, I'm being held back. There is a good chance that my children will join the ranks of individuals who can count on their parents for financial assistance to pay for college. Is there anything I wish I had done differently in my education? Yes, absolutely. Perhaps a vocational school I thought that being a plumber might be a good job, but if you want a four-year degree, take my advice and choose a college that you can afford both during and after graduation. I was overconfident that my student loan debt would pale in comparison to the lucrative writing career I enjoy after graduating. I'm now paying the price for that mistake in more ways than I could have ever anticipated.
To this day, I'm 43 years old, and I'm still saddled with a sizable amount of student loan debt. Yes, I was aware that I was taking out a lot of debt while attending college. It was only when I received two loans that I discovered the looming rock avalanche. Even now, 15 years later, I still have moments of absolute terror when it comes to the financial status of my family. My monthly student loan payment is more than three times the amount I pay for my automobile. As a result, I wouldn't have landed my current position without a four year degree. Because of it, I'm thankful, but at what price? My debts have been growing at a 10% annual pace, and they've now reached unmanageable proportions. You know I'm an English major. Their debts will never be repaid. We're in over our heads in debt with no end in sight. Because I'm in a class of grads whose only hope of attending college was to borrow money from the government, I'm being held back. There is a good chance that my children will join the ranks of individuals who can count on their parents for financial assistance to pay for college. Is there anything I wish I had done differently in my education? Yes, absolutely. Perhaps a vocational school I thought that being a plumber might be a good job, but if you want a four year degree, take my advice and choose a college that you can afford both during and after graduation. I was overconfident that my student loan debt would pale in comparison to the lucrative writing career I enjoy after graduating. I'm now paying the price for that mistake in more ways than I could have ever anticipated. How can we learn anything from animals if we don't examine their behavior? Because we want to know why animals do what they do. Many more motivations exist for researching animal behavior. If conservation biologists want to conserve animals, they need to know what they do themselves. Are these creatures sociable or lone wolf? Do they have enough room, and how many of their peers do they share it with? There are occasions when the results of a study can't be predicted. For a long time, Fernando Notterbaum was fascinated by how birds choose their songs. However, his study ended up reshaping the entire field of neurobiology in a way that was completely unexpected but incredibly enormous. And here is John Alcock's course textbook. How quickly a field animal's behavior changes is demonstrated by the fact that this is now in its ninth print version. There are a lot of new things going on out there. How can we learn anything from animals if we don't examine their behavior? Because we want to know why animals do what they do. Many more motivations exist for researching animal behavior. If conservation biologists want to conserve animals, they need to know what they do themselves. Are these creatures sociable or lone wolf? Do they have enough room, and how many of their peers do they share it with? There are occasions when the results of a study can't be predicted. For a long time, Fernando Notterbaum was fascinated by how birds choose their songs. However, his study ended up reshaping the entire field of neurobiology in a way that was completely unexpected but incredibly enormous. And here is John Alcock's course textbook. How quickly a field animal's behavior changes is demonstrated by the fact that this is now in its ninth print version. There are a lot of new things going on out there. Fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas, are what I'd want to talk about today. Trapped plant and animal remnants in sedimentary rock make up the phrase, fossil fuel. As you can see, live plants use the process of photosynthesis to capture and store energy from the sun. When the plant dies and decomposes, the majority of its energy is released. However, organic matter may be buried before it has decomposed to the point that it is no longer viable. A little amount of solar energy is trapped in the rocks, which is why fossil fuels are called fossil fuels. Even while a single growing season only traps a small quantity of biological materials, the cumulative remnants over millions of years are substantial. 
Fossil fuels are non-renewable resources because the accumulation rate is so slow, millions of times slower than the pace at which humans extract and burn organic matter for energy. We'll talk about renewable fossil fuel alternatives tomorrow. Fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas, are what I'd want to talk about today. Trapped plant and animal remnants in sedimentary rock make up the phrase, fossil fuel. As you can see, live plants use the process of photosynthesis to capture and store energy from the sun. When the plant dies and decomposes, the majority of its energy is released. However, organic matter may be buried before it has decomposed to the point that it is no longer viable. A little amount of solar energy is trapped in the rocks, which is why fossil fuels are called fossil fuels. Even while a single growing season only traps a small quantity of biological materials, the cumulative remnants over millions of years are substantial. Fossil fuels are non-renewable resources because the accumulation rate is so slow, millions of times slower than the pace at which humans extract and burn organic matter for energy. We'll talk about renewable fossil fuel alternatives tomorrow. If you look at our topographical map, you'll discover that the center part of North America, from the Rocky Mountains to the Mississippi River, is very flat. That's right, folks, this is the heartland of the United States. The term, prairie, or, steppe can be used to describe this type of land. Now that's some serious STEPP. Level ground, a dry climate, and no trees are the primary characteristics. Great Plains are really the remnants of an ancient seabed that formerly covered most of the area. The dry seabed was smoothed out over millions of years by glacial silt, water, and wind. The Rocky Mountains form a western boundary for the Great Plains. It is the Rockies, not the Plains, that have formed the grasslands. It's because of the mountain's height that the Pacific Ocean's heavy damp air can't flow eastward. Over the mountains, the air is lighter and drier. Only grass was able to thrive on the windswept, parched plain until people built irrigation systems and farms. In reality, the Great Plains may be divided into three distinct regions. The grass is short towards the west, where it is the driest and most windy. More rain falls in the eastern zone, where grass may reach a height of 360 cm. For the most part, grasses of an intermediate height may be found here. If you look at our topographical map, you'll discover that the center part of North America, from the Rocky Mountains to the Mississippi River, is very flat. That's right, folks, this is the heartland of the United States. The term, prairie, or, steppe can be used to describe this type of land. Now that's some serious STEPP. Level ground, a dry climate, and no trees are the primary characteristics. Great Plains are really the remnants of an ancient seabed that formerly covered most of the area. The dry seabed was smoothed out over millions of years by glacial silt, water, and wind. The Rocky Mountains form a western boundary for the Great Plains. It is the Rockies, not the Plains, that have formed the grasslands. It's because of the mountain's height that the Pacific Ocean's heavy damp air can't flow eastward. 
Over the mountains, the air is lighter and drier. Only grass was able to thrive on the windswept, parched plain until people built irrigation systems and farms. In reality, the Great Plains may be divided into three distinct regions. The grass is short towards the west, where it is the driest and most windy. More rain falls in the eastern zone, where grass may reach a height of 360 cm. For the most part, grasses of an intermediate height may be found here. Nobody knows exactly when humans began to create fermented beverages. The earliest known evidence comes from 7000 BCE in China, where residue in clay pots has revealed that people were making an alcoholic beverage from fermented rice, millet, grapes, and honey. Within a few thousand years, cultures all over the world were fermenting their own drinks. Ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians made beer throughout the year from stored cereal grains. This beer was available to all social classes, and workers even received it in their daily rations. They also made wine, but because the climate wasn't ideal for growing grapes, it was a rare and expensive delicacy. By contrast, in Greece and Rome, where grapes grew more easily, wine was as readily available as beer was in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Because yeasts will ferment basically any plant sugars, ancient peoples made alcohol from whatever crops and plants grew where they lived. In South America, people made chicha from grains, sometimes adding hallucinogenic herbs. In what's now Mexico, polk, made from cactus sap, was the drink of choice, while East Africans made banana and palm beer. And in the area that's now Japan, people made sake from rice. Nobody knows exactly when humans began to create fermented beverages. The earliest known evidence comes from 7000 BCE in China, where residue in clay pots has revealed that people were making an alcoholic beverage from fermented rice, millet, grapes, and honey. Within a few thousand years, cultures all over the world were fermenting their own drinks. Ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians made beer throughout the year from stored cereal grains. This beer was available to all social classes, and workers even received it in their daily rations. They also made wine, but because the climate wasn't ideal for growing grapes, it was a rare and expensive delicacy. By contrast, in Greece and Rome, where grapes grew more easily, wine was as readily available as beer was in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Because yeasts will ferment basically any plant sugars, ancient peoples made alcohol from whatever crops and plants grew where they lived. In South America, people made chicha from grains, sometimes adding hallucinogenic herbs. In what's now Mexico, polk, made from cactus sap, was the drink of choice, while East Africans made banana and palm beer. And in the area that's now Japan, people made sake from rice. Sincerely, it's nice to see so many of you interested in our series on survival in outer space. Cameras are filming us for the local TV stations, so please bear with us. Tonight I'm going to speak about the most fundamental part of survival the spacesuit. That's usually the first thing that springs to mind when you think of an astronaut, isn't it? We could not possibly exist in space without the use of spacesuits. For example, outer space is a vacuum there's no gravity or air pressure, without protection, a body would explode. The temperatures would range from as high as 300 degrees above zero Fahrenheit to as low as 300 degrees below zero as well, depending on whether we were in the sun or the shade. The spacesuit that NASA has produced is definitely a marvel. This photo enlargement above is a life-size photograph of an actual spacesuit worn by astronauts on the final space shuttle voyage. The torso is located here. A seven-layer construction ensures a long lifespan. This thick layer of insulation shields the home from the damaging effects of both heat and radiation. What they term a bladder of oxygen is an inflated sac filled with oxygen that is used to mimic the pressure of an actual atmosphere. 
This bladder presses against the body with the same force as the Earth's atmosphere at sea level. The deepest layers offer liquid cooling and ventilation. The outfit, despite its many layers, is supple and allows us to move freely as we work. The helmet of the spacesuit is another high-tech component. To show you, I brought one with me. Is it possible to bring in a volunteer to demonstrate? Sincerely, it's nice to see so many of you interested in our series on survival in outer space. Cameras are filming us for the local TV stations, so please bear with us. Tonight I'm going to speak about the most fundamental part of survival the spacesuit. That's usually the first thing that springs to mind when you think of an astronaut, isn't it? We could not possibly exist in space without the use of spacesuits. For example, outer space is a vacuum there's no gravity or air pressure, without protection, a body would explode. The temperatures would range from as high as 300 degrees above zero Fahrenheit to as low as 300 degrees below zero as well, depending on whether we were in the sun or the shade. The spacesuit that NASA has produced is definitely a marvel. This photo enlargement above is a life-size photograph of an actual spacesuit worn by astronauts on the final space shuttle voyage. The torso is located here. A seven-layer construction ensures a long lifespan. This thick layer of insulation shields the home from the damaging effects of both heat and radiation. What they term a bladder of oxygen is an inflated sac filled with oxygen that is used to mimic the pressure of an actual atmosphere. This bladder presses against the body with the same force as the Earth's atmosphere at sea level. The deepest layers offer liquid cooling and ventilation. The outfit, despite its many layers, is supple and allows us to move freely as we work. The helmet of the spacesuit is another high-tech component. To show you, I brought one with me. Is it possible to bring in a volunteer to demonstrate? My name is Steve Pinker, and I teach at Harvard University's Department of Psychology as a Johnston family professor. After contemporary scientific study of the mind, the cognitive revolution at Harvard began. If you're a scientist who studies the mind, you're faced with the immediate dilemma of what to do with all of these mental contents, such as ideas, feelings, visions, goals, and laws, that you can't see, taste, or otherwise experience. You are meant to study things that you can see, measure, and manipulate in science, so how can you even begin to research the science of minds? Well, the truth is that in the middle of the 20th century, the prevailing psychology was to just give up all discussion of mental substance. This is the school of behaviorism, which dominated American psychology until the early 1950s, when a group of Harvard-affiliated scientists began to re-examine the fundamental assumption that computers can't function without calculating internal states of the machines themselves. You can say the same things about a computer as you can about a human being, so why not about a scrap of metal? People who conduct experiments on humans in the lab, as well as linguist Noam Chomsky's prominent theories on language and computer science and artificial intelligence, were included in the new field of cognitive science.
My name is Steve Pinker, and I teach at Harvard University's Department of Psychology as a Johnston family professor. After contemporary scientific study of the mind, the cognitive revolution at Harvard began. If you're a scientist who studies the mind, you're faced with the immediate dilemma of what to do with all of these mental contents, such as ideas, feelings, visions, goals, and laws, that you can't see, taste, or otherwise experience. You are meant to study things that you can see, measure, and manipulate in science, so how can you even begin to research the science of minds? Well, the truth is that in the middle of the 20th century, the prevailing psychology was to just give up all discussion of mental substance. This is the school of behaviorism, which dominated American psychology until the early 1950s, when a group of Harvard-affiliated scientists began to re-examine the fundamental assumption that computers can't function without calculating internal states of the machines themselves. You can say the same things about a computer as you can about a human being, so why not about a scrap of metal? People who conduct experiments on humans in the lab, as well as linguist Noam Chomsky's prominent theories on language and computer science and artificial intelligence, were included in the new field of cognitive science. In today's lecture, I'll discuss changes in air pollution since the mid-19th century and the factors that have contributed to these changes. As a result, by the 1950s, air pollution was quite evident in many big cities throughout the world, with regular thick black fogs known as smogs. Factory pollution was the primary source of this pollution, which resulted in serious health issues. In 1952, for example, a particularly severe fog in London killed approximately 4,000 people. Something had to be done, therefore the Clean Air Act was passed in 1956 in the United Kingdom. The pollution from manufacturers was handled, and the smogs dissipated quickly. However, as you may be aware, air pollution is still a major concern today. The fundamental difference between now and the 1950s is that it is not apparent, it is imperceptible. Furthermore, vehicles and lorries are now the primary sources of pollution, and while these do not generate obvious symptoms, they nonetheless pose a considerable health danger. And one of the major contributors to the rise in this form of pollution is our increased reliance on automobiles. There are many more vehicles, trucks, trains, and aircraft on the road now than there were in the 1950s, and this is now the primary cause of air pollution worldwide. In today's lecture, I'll discuss changes in air pollution since the mid-19th century and the factors that have contributed to these changes. As a result, by the 1950s, air pollution was quite evident in many big cities throughout the world, with regular thick black fogs known as smogs. Factory pollution was the primary source of this pollution, which resulted in serious health issues. In 1952, for example, a particularly severe fog in London killed approximately 4,000 people. Something had to be done, therefore the Clean Air Act was passed in 1956 in the United Kingdom. The pollution from manufacturers was handled, and the smogs dissipated quickly. However, as you may be aware, air pollution is still a major concern today. The fundamental difference between now and the 1950s is that it is not apparent, it is imperceptible. Furthermore, vehicles and lorries are now the primary sources of pollution, and while these do not generate obvious symptoms, they nonetheless pose a considerable health danger. And one of the major contributors to the rise in this form of pollution is our increased reliance on automobiles. There are many more vehicles, trucks, trains, and aircraft on the road now than there were in the 1950s, and this is now the primary cause of air pollution worldwide. A mysterious sickness afflicting Swiss mercenaries stationed overseas was first brought to the attention of a medical student called Johannes Hofer in the late 17th century. This illness was so severe that many troops had to be released because of its effects on their physical health and mental well-being. 
Hofer observed that the problem was not a physical one, but rather a strong desire to return to their mountains. Neonosophy is a word coined by him, combining the Greek words nostos homecoming, and algos pain or desire to describe the state. It was first thought that Swiss people were more prone to nostalgia than those from other countries. Several specialists believe that the continual ringing of cowbells in the Alps is damaging to the ears and brains of the people who live there. Traditional Swiss melodies were banned from being sung by troops because they were feared to encourage desertion or suicide. Nostalgia has been noticed in numerous communities, though, as migration has expanded throughout the world. Anyone who had been away from home for a lengthy period of time was susceptible to feelings of nostalgia. It was no longer considered a neurological disorder by the early 20th century, but rather a mental illness related to depression. A mysterious sickness afflicting Swiss mercenaries stationed overseas was first brought to the attention of a medical student called Johannes Hofer in the late 17th century. This illness was so severe that many troops had to be released because of its effects on their physical health and mental well-being. Hofer observed that the problem was not a physical one, but rather a strong desire to return to their mountains. Neonosophy is a word coined by him, combining the Greek words nostos homecoming, and algos pain or desire to describe the state. It was first thought that Swiss people were more prone to nostalgia than those from other countries. Several specialists believe that the continual ringing of cowbells in the Alps is damaging to the ears and brains of the people who live there. Traditional Swiss melodies were banned from being sung by troops because they were feared to encourage desertion or suicide. Nostalgia has been noticed in numerous communities, though, as migration has expanded throughout the world. Anyone who had been away from home for a lengthy period of time was susceptible to feelings of nostalgia. It was no longer considered a neurological disorder by the early 20th century, but rather a mental illness related to depression. <laughs> 